Here we go. Today is June 17th, 2018, and this is episode 219 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Kellett. Good evening, Jerry. I'm glad to see the volcano did not get you in your Joe versus the volcano uh, imitation. They were, they were. Uh, I think they were going to try to sacrifice me to get it to calm down, but I, I managed to <laughs> escape. <laughs> But I hope you had a good trip to Hawaii, it, which is in part why we haven't recorded lately. It was um, it was phenomenal, probably the best vacation I've ever had. So, wow! And then you got to come back to me. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was uh, it was good. And you uh, you just had your own vacation too. I did. I did ten days in Colorado with the wife, and it was great. Um, Love me some Colorado. Yeah, it's but a uh, beautiful country out there. Yeah, yeah, we wandered all over and and all over the mountains and the parks and cities and all sorts of fun stuff and now now we're back to reality yep that's the, that's the way it works <laughs> so uh, just a reminder that uh, before we, we get into the show our the thoughts and opinions we express on the show are ours and do not represent those of our employers and also a thank you uh, a heartfelt thank you to our patreon donors thank you absolutely very much. thank you guys and so uh, also by the way this is our uh, father's day episode so uh, happy, it is. happy Father's Day. And also, um, we uh, were, were unable to have a, a, a GDPR Day spectacular, which I was actually hoping to do, but I was um, on a beach instead. Uh, so, <laughs> so hopefully everybody still has all their arms and legs uh, post, post May 25th. I've, I've not heard a ton of um, you know, horror stories, but um, you know, I think the, the damage toll is still out, so... Do we need to do a, a GDPR focused episode one of these days? I think we absolutely do. Yeah, um, and, and, okay. and you know, uh, part part of the reason it hasn't really made a lot of sense is that there's so much that's kind of misunderstood and not fully settled yet with respect to the GDPR. So, but I think that's really rapidly coming to a close. So, anyway. Um, Moving into our stories, the first one we have tonight comes from CSO Online, and the title here is, What Does a Ransomware Attack Cost? Beware the Hidden Expenses. And, you know, hopefully this is relatively self-explanatory or, or, or unsurprising, but they go through a couple of examples uh, about some of the hidden costs of dealing with a ransomware attack if you're an you know, an organization. So the the first example they bring up is the Erie County Medical Center, who um, who had uh, I think it was last year, la- yeah, last July, they had a couple thousand workstations locked up and uh, being held for a thirty thousand dollar ransom. They actually ended up spending ten million dollars in response to that attack, which included ouch, yeah, things like uh, overtime from their uh, of their employees and uh, services and software and whatnot so you know r- relatively small uh, you know i i think the the whole point of this article is while the the ransom itself is often somewhat meager the kind of the totality of the costs that you wrap that you rack up is significantly higher and by the way that's almost without regard to whether or not you pay the ransom. You're going to incur these costs. Uh, that's some of the psychology behind the ransomware cost, right? The, the bad guys know if they keep it within a relatively palatable range, most victims or some proportion of victims at least will do the math and say, you know, I don't want to spend $4 million on cleanup. I'll spend the $50,000 on the ransom and hope they give me the the key and I can move on with my life. So if it were a stupid amount of money, they probably would not get many takers. True. True. But I think, you know, I think in the, in the end analysis, a lot of organizations who even do pay the ransom end up spending tons of money. Well, it, it yeah, absolutely. Because it usually, 
causes a knee-jerk reaction, well, maybe not knee-jerk, but at least a reaction of why did we fall into this trap and how can we avoid it again, which causes a cycle of spend and consultants and hiring and beefing up the InfoSec department typically. Yep. And the next example they had was uh, the city of Atlanta, which we covered a, a couple of weeks or months back, I guess now. It was back in March. Uh, at the time, they had spent $5 million dollars in, in response and it's not referenced in this article but there were there was some news while I was out on the beach that um, Atlanta was actually requesting another nine and a half million dollars I think related to this which is um, it will take the, the total up to about 14 million dollars that's um, that's some serious money and and I, I I get the feeling though that some organizations are, you know, it kind of reminds me of the, the the old Kevin Mitnick AT&T story where AT&T tried to, you know, put, throw the cost of a building into the mm-hmm. damages, right? <laughs> and so I think to some extent there, you know, we do see that. Like I, and I believe, I don't know this to be fact, but I believe that the city of Atlanta at least is tying the cost of, uh, of some pretty significant upgrades and, and migrations of their IT from uh, you know from traditional systems to cloud. At least that's kind of the you know, the the implied <laughs> stuff in some of the the, the, the stories I've read. Um, well, you know, one, one quick aside on Atlanta too. The another story that we're not covering in depth, but came out um, was that they lost years of police dash cam footage. Right. As part of the attack, which right. uh, now you're looking at potentially throwing off prosecutions and, you know, various legal issues. Uh, so, you know, in that case, it gets even uglier when you look at what could be the potential cost involved and how do you potentially even quantify the cost of, hey, we had a deads to right case against this bad guy and now we can't even prosecute him because we lost this dash cam footage. Yeah, or or defend your officers against you know, wrongful accusations or or sure. know, contra right. So yeah, I mean that's that's bad, it's bad news. I mean it's high, high stakes right there. And and uh, yep, I, I I suspect we're we're only on the upswing here. And they, then next they talked about talk about uh, in Colorado the Department of Transportation. Uh, they they had to set aside. A, there's no clear. S- indication of how much they spent but they set aside two million dollars to recover from an infection on 2000 systems so you know there's a there's there's clearly a wide disparity in in the amount of money different uh, especially government entities seem to be spending in in response but there is a um a, a quote from a company called Cybersecurity ventures who said that they're predicting uh the damages in 2000 19 will exceed from ransomware will exceed 11 and a half billion dollars that's not just the ransomware you know people paying ransom it's you know all the the associated costs which is a pretty significant amount of money and you know the again the whole point of this article is when you're when you're thinking about how significant um, a, a threat ransomware is and in, in trying to figure out you know what what is the potential downside it it, you know, the extent of the costs go far beyond the ransom, and there's lots of other categories of of costs, like you know the inc- engaging an incident response company, and if you have to make any like the city of Atlanta did. By the way, I'm not I'm not accusing them of doing anything in, improper, but there you know there may be a, a, a situation like this may make you realize that the current way you have your IT structured is unsustainable going forward if you're going to av- you know avoid a similar thing in you know in the future so you know you may have some some really significant uh, cash outlays to recover from these things and and all those costs may not be be well uh, you know easy e- easy to account for beforehand and there's a bit of a political and game aspect here too where you have this event it's a terrible event but you've had all these ideas pending for many years or things you want to do or things you know you need to do and 
some ways, psychologically, it makes sense for executives to lump all that into one big hit and move on. And then they can say, hey, this was all because of this breach and, you know, kind of like a write down of goodwill or, or of assets in, in a bad acquisition. Um, you know, sure. sometimes it's easier to just take the lumps and move on. Uh, so, yeah, if you've got that, you know, you're already in a bad situation, make the best of the bad situation by lumping in as many other costs as you can that are even ancillary related to your, your breach recovery. Yeah, cause, you know, the, the bad news is already out there. You may as well stuff as much, <laughs> stuff as much uh, 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 you know, loss as you can into that because you, right. you, know, you can, you, you, it, it's typically viewed as a one-time thing, right? So it's not a, it's not Hopefully. a. Well, I mean, I think from the perspective of investors, an incident like this is viewed as a right. one-time thing. You know, it's not you know your 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 ongoing costs didn't increase as a result of your um, or significantly increase as a result of the incident. So, anyway, uh, moving on to a, yet another ransomware-related story. This one comes from Bank Info Security, and the title is "Mental Health Provider Pays Ransom to Recover Data." And so the the story here is um, a, a Minnesota-based organization called the Associates in Psychiatry and Psychology paid, uh, I think it was uh, forty, if I'm not mistaken, about forty-four thousand dollars to recover uh, the the data of about seven. I'm trying to find the exact number, but about sixty-five hundred uh, people, and you know they ended up reporting this to to the uh, Department of Health and Human Services because it was a HIPAA-related breach. But one thing that, by the way, th- when I read this article, I-, I don't know if it was just the author of this article, but it seemed like th- um, the, the, this company, <laughs> at least in the article again, came off as being like really cavalier. I don't know if you, you picked up on that too. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, you know... Go on. But yes, I, there was some weird vibe there. But uh, my thought was, who knows how much legal representation is in between uh, them and uh, whoever's reporting on this. And Yeah. So so anyway, the, um, the, the organization here uh, made the decision that it would be more economical for them to pay the ransom than it would be to, you know, to, to try to uh, recover the data. The ransom was fifty five thousand. Fifty five thousand. Thank you. Yep, four Bitcoin at the time was valued at fifty five thousand. I knew four yep. was in there somewhere. Yep. No, it's all good. Well, you know what's interesting too, and I think health providers have have an extra special difficulty here to because they're there to provide critical services to their, you know, their patients, and if something gets in the way of providing critical care to their patients. You know, their onus is on getting that care back as quickly as possible. So, you know, you can almost see that the logic making a little more sense in a healthcare situation of saying, just pay the ransom, get our systems back, and we'll deal with the rest later. Yeah. So, you know, in in, in this this particular case, they were you know, the some of the some of the cavalierness, I guess, was you know, they they were basically saying that, hey, you know, we we. Um, an attacker really couldn't use the data very, you know, w- without without our software. You know, it's, while it's not encrypted, they they wouldn't have had access to the software needed to access the data. And and I, you know, I've seen that attitude quite a lot. And I'm, I, you know, I'm not sure that's a good a good attitude to take. Yeah, that's a dangerous assumption. <laughs> very very dangerous assumption. But you know the. the it, it you mentioned a, a good point, and this kind of goes back to the previous story. Why why I really wanted to talk about these together? You know, in 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 this particular case, they found it. I, I believe they actually had the ability to recover the uh, the data from backups, but they chose to to pay the um, you know, pay the ransom because it was a more expedient way to get back up and running. And and that's really odd, and kind of frustrating. At least for for me as a as a security practitioner, it's kind of a frustrating position to be in because you you know, you have the ability, you have the capability to restore, yet 
you know, it's it, it's a, a more economically viable or an, an attractive um, pursuit to to pay the to pay the ransom. And so that kind of says to me, you know, going forward, not only do we have to make sure that we actually have the data backed up, but it needs to be, you know, that the, the totality of the IT environment needs to be such that you can actually recover in a in a some something of a reasonable time frame and so i guess you know point is was a long way to say that it seemed like their um their their um uh, you know recovery time objective was not uh, was not very good or it was not well, I, in line with what their business needed how about that like mm, could be yeah that's fair but i would say that in general assuming that the the bad guys are on the up and up and they give you the key in a timely manner and the key works, I think that's always going to be faster than trying to rebuild from backups. Well, I, okay. I, I, I will mean, go I, with that. I will agree Unless you that. have like VMware snapshots that you could just drop back into place and, you know, spin back up immediately. But I agree with that. Uh, but here's, you know, and we didn't talk about this on the previous story, but it is, it is material to the discussion. And that is, I, I guess if you're, if you're willing, yeah, I'm I'm having a real hard time coming to terms with this, but you know, if you're willing to just decrypt things, and then move on, I guess that does make sense. But any, I we would, don't we don't know what their follow up response was. Either, well, that's right? we don't know if that's if, if 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 they did a root cause analysis and said, okay, we got this ransomware because we're using, or we haven't patched this particular vulnerability. Okay, let's get those patched. Okay, let's do this. Uh, you know. And again, as a healthcare provider, their their main concern may be let's make sure that we can provide a standard of care to our to our patients um, in the short term. Now, am I saying they're making the best possible decisions, or that we would make those decisions? I don't know. I mean, we weren't in that situation, but I would say that I think it, a lot of large organizations that have a backup and recovery strategy have a really good strategy on paper that really sucks in the real world and they don't know it until they really do it. And then they find out how weak it is. And, um, it's not nearly as simple as all the backup and recovery documentations as it's going to be. Yeah. I, I guess that in, I think all of, all of what you just said makes good sense and you're absolutely right. Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face is, is, um, right. is, is <laughs> right. George Foreman that said that I think. Right. Um, it, I guess the the specific thing that concerns me is that you're returning to service something that was previously infected. And, you know... Yeah, you, you still have to understand the root cause analysis. Like, what, what caused the initial compromise? What caused the, in, the initial ransomware infection, if you will? Um, and hopefully address that. Yeah, but, you know, I, I so I guess... Again, you know, it's it's a it's a difficult thing to talk about in the abstract. But the concern mm -hmm. the concern I have is, y y what else was there, right? I mean, okay, so yes, you, you know, you 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 you've nailed the root cause. You can say that's how it propagated. But you know, was there anything else there that that happened? And how did you get comfortable that you don't need to rebuild your environment from the ground up anyway? That's my. Well, that's an that's an interesting question, and yeah, we don't have a lot of data on that, but right. That, that's uh, by the way, that's the one one thing that when I hear companies that, that pay the ransom, I, I intuitively it makes sense that it's you know it's often easier and, and faster to return the service, assuming you know everything works out the way they they hope. They get the key and the key works and blah blah blah, right? But you know, <laughs> from a I mean, I've 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 seen so many times where, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, you know, the, 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 the ransomware was one of an unknown number of attacks. Right. And, you know, so anyway, um, I, I, I get it. I, I guess the, what I'm struggling with is that I think most organizations don't have folks or aren't empowering folks to go to the level that you want to go to on this one. Well, that that's true, uh, but I guess m from a from a risk perspective, the the concern I would have if I were if I were this company, the concern I would have is how do how am I going to make sure that in another month I don't have to report another breach because right. I didn't completely evict 
you know, all of the actors that were in, and, and, and at that point, now you got people throwing racks at you saying, well, you know, that was a really dumb thing you did. So anyway, I, I, I just think it's a really risky, uh, for, for a bunch of different reasons. I think it's a risky play to take, but I, I mean, I, I get it. I do. All right. So moving on to our next story, this one comes from it business edge. Um, fairly unconventional source for uh, for our story <laughs> here, or for our show here um in the, the title is did we see our first data breach of the gdpr era dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. that's right so um there's a uh, th- there's an organization called ticket fly and apparently ticket fly is as far i didn't do a ton of research on them but they they appear to be a um uh a uh, uh, just phone it in on the show, yeah. aren't you? Just phone it oh, in. Phone it in. That's right. Still in vacation mode. <laughs> um, it is a, uh, a a service where different you know, musical artists and things, like, uh, you know, groups like that can sign up and um, sell tickets to you know to their concerts and whatnot. And uh, and so anyway, th- this uh, ticket fly was breached. They um, but. But the the you know kind of the twist on this is the way that Ticketfly has characterized the event. They didn't call it a data breach; they called it a cyber incident. And so the point of this particular article is: <laughs> is this um, you know is this kind of some unique and interesting things that we'll you know we'll see going forward, where people are intentionally organizations are intentionally trying to avoid the phrase data breach. And in this particular case, it's almost impossible to consider it not a data breach because 26 million email addresses, names, physical addresses, and I think a few other pieces of phone numbers, I think, um, you know, showed up. Uh, you know, I think some of, some of the data was even provided to um, uh, motherboard, device.com. <laughs> And, and uh, some of it showed up in the have I been pwned.com list. And so it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's very clearly a data breach. What's less clear to me, and this was actually the research I was trying to do, was figure out, you know, where are they located? Do they have any particular ties uh, to the EU? And I've not been able to confirm or, or, or deny that. But, um, you know, it's, it's um, be interesting to see there's a by the way there's a whole lot of people who have a very confused view of who the GDPR does and does not apply to and by the way it's taken it's taken me a long time and lots of discussions with different lawyers to under to really get my head around it and um, you know if you're for instance if this ticket fly was a US based company and they kind of coincidentally had uh, European citizens purchasing tickets and those tickets were not for, uh, you know, for, for uh, concerts that were in the EU. It's very unlikely that they, that they would fall into the scope of the GDPR. And I know that I'll get lots and lots of uh, people telling me that I'm wrong, but I will tell you, go read Spain versus Google and then come back. And we'll talk. Man, you you're just being all lawyery. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. So, <laughs> speak of lawyers. Uh, the way I read this is, uh, it, we're not going to call it a data breach until a court of law orders us to call it a data breach. Yes. Correct. <laughs> Correct. But, but then I think that was yeah. the whole. That was the point. Is like you know, under under the under the auspices or under the, in the age of the GDPR, it seems likely that. You know, we're going to see companies not wanting to, to use the words data breach, you know, that trying to find yep. very creative ways to call it other things. And, you know, I, and by the way, I, I, I wonder um, about things like ransomware because, you know, historically, a lot of the, the data breach reporting regimes have taken a pretty skeptical view that, you know, you, you kind of have to prove that a ransomware attack didn't involve, um, you know, disclosure of the data, and and you know, often that's not possible to do. But I'm I'm 
wondering if we're going to see some <laughs> some innovation in incident reporting. No, Your Honor, this was not a data breach. This was an unplanned and unauthorized data backup. <laughs> A, a rogue administrator, an un, <laughs> undocumented administrator. That's right. This was an unplanned <laughs> cloud integration. <laughs> oh my! I we feel this strengthens our company because it shows resilience in our data feeds. That's right. That's right. We are all about availability. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Can't steal it if it's freely available, right? <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. yeah that's no, but right. but very long story short, I, I I think you're right that we're going to get a lot of creative wordplay over the next year or two as this all gets worked up. Because you know, as much as we think we know about GDPR, I think everybody who is deeply involved is waiting for case law to see what happens when things are actually, you know, fines are are levied and then the companies fight those fines in court and uh, see what actually survives the judiciary in the EU or perhaps other venues uh, as this is, is, you know, tested in yeah. court. And, and, and I know the EU authorities have been saying from the beginning, they're looking for examples. They want to make examples of big companies. So I don't think it'll take long. No. And, and, and I, I would say it's also you know, from what I understand, I, I, you know, I would, I would think that, organizations who are kind of flouting the law or, or, you know, intentionally trying to be cute are the ones that are, are probably going to feel the most significant wrath. So I, it, it seems like, uh, now I don't know specifically about this case. I don't know enough about this case, but you know, it seems like if you were, if you were to, to, to try to get out of, uh, of, of report your reporting responsibilities because you were calling it a, uh, cybersecurity incident rather than a data breach, you know, when in fact some data was was leaked. Um, I, I think they're, I think they're going to look upon that really unfavorably, and and that's, you know, probably going to get you the biggest fine. So, but we'll see. You know, we we don't we don't really know. We we know that, um, you know, that the the data protection authorities in Europe have have told told people very publicly that they are staffing up aggressively with um, you know with enforcement people and uh, you know so so we know that they're out there and by the way uh, you know we again this is you know this this episode's coming out about two weeks after uh, the GDPR went into effect but you know that the first lawsuits were actually filed on May 25th and th- there was a, a guy named Max Schrems in uh, Austria, who is the person who I believe, if memory serves, he was the person who uh, got the EU Court of Justice to um, uh, t- to invalidate the old safe harbor uh, data transfer so rule. What is his lawsuit regarding? Well, so he's suing Facebook and he's suing Google and Facebook is suing a couple of different properties like Instagram and I think Facebook itself and 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 uh, Google for Android and basically what he's saying is that the the GDPR one of the one of the tenets of the GDPR is that you as an organization have to obtain consent from a from a data subject from a person to collect their data and not only that you really can't collect the you know data that's not specifically required to perf- you know to perform the service and his interpretation, and by the way, I'm you know I am not a lawyer, but his interpretation of the GDPR is that if y- you as a data subject have the right to decline consent to c- have your data collected and still receive the benefit of the service. So so what he basically is saying is that you know Facebook is running around right and they, they are doing this by the way facebook is running around saying that you know they've gotten consent from you know all, you know, most the, the vast majority of their customer base in europe has given consent the consent required under the gdpr but it's a take it or leave it uh thing right you know it's you can you can provide consent or you no longer are allowed to use facebook or instagram 
I mean, it just uh, I'm probably overly dramatizing that a little bit, but that's that's effectively what the claim is. And 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 um, so so Max is actually, or I should say, Mr. Schrems, has actually formed a company or like a nonprofit called None of Your Business, and that that nonprofit's sole purpose is going to be to sue. Uh, sue companies who, who who they believe are running afoul of the GDPR. Interesting. So you know, look out. <laughs> it's going to get interesting. Well, this reminds me of there were companies that were spun up just to go after uh, companies in the U.S. that didn't abide by the Americans with Disability Act. Um, Absolutely. It, right. it, it ended up, you know, those. I would say most people in general felt that that was a racket and a shakedown of a lot of companies. So hopefully that's not where this ends up going as a, you know, just a, a get rich quick scheme for lawyers, uh, and is actually a meaningful, uh, endeavor. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I will say that, that I know, um, you know, that Max Schrems is, uh, is, is a very well-known privacy activist. I don't know what will, you know, happen over the long term, but I, I mean, I do think that he is, you know, from, from his perspective acting in, you know, he's he's trying to do what he believes is the right thing. You know, sure. For, for the yeah, privacy. I, in his case, sure. I'm just wondering about you know other sure. other folks spinning up similar <laughs> endeavors. Well, I, I I will tell you, and this is <laughs> starting to turn into that GDPR show we talked about. But um, I, in the run up to the to the GDP to May 25th, when the GDPR took effect, there were um, there were lots of I, I guess somewhat tongue in cheek. Uh, um, data data request forms that that people were kind of jointly putting together so that they could submit to all you know everybody that they thought had their data which you know would just ask an obnoxious number of questions about you know what kind of data did they have where did it come from and you know and on and on and on and on and you know i i, I do think that there very likely is some of some of that going on today. I've not seen any statistics on on that. You know, like I, I don't know if there's companies out there that are, you know, finding these requests to be onerous. In general, the 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 GDPR gives data subjects or or the the data controllers one month to respond. So you know, it's you have to respond in a reasonable time frame, but in in no case more than I think a month. Unless there's some, you know, extenuating circumstances. So, so I suspect probably later this month we'll start hearing some of the ugly about um, you know, about handling data requests. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I, I wonder if uh, there's also a judgment to be made for certain companies to say, you know, we're just not going to deal with European customers. Well, we've seen some of that. Um, you know, we th- there have been a couple of uh, I, I'm. I'm drawing a blank on their names right now, but we have seen a couple of that, uh, a couple of cases of that. We saw the the. I, I'm still not sure if this was a joke or a real thing, but we saw the the browser pl- or the uh, the website plugin that would block um, access to European citizens. And by the way, I I don't, you know, again we're we're all catching up here. But on the on May 25th, and I don't know what it, where it stands now, but. On May 25th, there were quite a few U.S. news outlets like the L.A. Times, and I don't know, I don't remember um, which other ones. AZ Central comes to mind for some reason. Um, you know, quite a few, quite a few websites actually went dark from the perspective of the EU because you know they basically said um, we're not. I'm paraphrasing, but you know the website said we're not. You're coming from the EU. We're not you're GDPR compliant yet, so. Uh, you know, there's nothing for you to see here, right? Um, you know, and then there was uh, there was easy DN- easy DNS. I, I don't remember if we talked about this one or not, but easy DNS and is a, is a Canada based DNS company, and they kind of flipped the bird to the GDPR um, because there's the whole uh, the whole hoopla about um, the who is uh, who is registration being. Right. Um, you know, not not in compliance with the GDPR, but you know, if you're a domain registrar contractually, you have to maintain the Who Is registry. <laughs> I, I think what we're finding is a crap ton of unintended consequences of such a broad 
sweeping law. And yeah. it'll be interesting how it all plays out. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, 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 I do wonder about those un, unintended consequences. I think we're we're gonna be feeling the effects of that for a while. Uh, so anyway, more more to come for sure. Yep. So anyway, that's uh, that's the show for this week. I think um, you know, now that we're both back, uh, you know, summer vacation season is over. We should hopefully be uh, back on a on a normal schedule. Sounds good to me. All right. Well, take care, and we'll talk again uh, hopefully next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye.